Romans chapter 15. We'll begin with verse 14. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to, to admonish one another. But I have written very boldly to you on some point, so that it's to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering to the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem around about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And thus I aspired to preach the gospel not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. For this reason I have often been prevented from coming to you, but now with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you, wherever I, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and be helped on my way there by you, when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to be here in this place of worship, Lord, and we can worship you. Father, I pray that you would open up our hearts to your word. Father, that we would understand everything that you have prepared for us to receive today. Father, may your Holy Spirit, may he teach us and guide us in all things. And Father, pierce our hearts with your word, with the truth. That not only will you give us understanding, Lord, but we will be drawn closer and closer to you. That lives will be changed as a result of what you do in this place, given by your Holy Spirit this morning. Father, I pray as always, the words of my mouth, the meditation in my heart, may it be pleasing in your sight. You are my rock and my redeemer. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and amen. amen. May be seated. This morning I want to share with you what a Great Commission church looks like. Because... Actually, there is no other church to strive in Scripture. All churches should be a great commission church. All of God's people should be great commission Christians because that's what it means. That's what it meant when Jesus told them to go and make disciples in Matthew chapter 28 and other places as well. But what does it look like to be a great commission church? That's what I want to share with you. We talk about the different ministry opportunities we have and mission opportunities, and the truth is they're all out there. There, are, there is no lack of mission opportunities. There is a lack of those who are willing to be involved in mission opportunities. There is a lack of that. It's not the lack of opportunity. It's a lack of willingness that is plaguing the church today. You know, it's a crying shame, but the Southern Baptist Convention has basically plateaued, and we are barely growing, if anything, or if anything, declining. You hear those reports every single year. Also, it's, it's saddening that every year thousands and thousands of churches close their doors because they're dying out. You know, they're dying out because they're not adding people. In other words, they're not reaching people for Christ as the congregation gets older, as people pass on. The truth is there's nobody there to fill those spots because nothing's being done. And yet if we would be obedient to God's word, I'm convinced that that would not be the case for anybody. It wouldn't be the case. It's not about the numbers. It's about the lack of passion to reach people for Jesus Christ. That's the troubling part. It's not about numbers. But yet, a great commission church in Romans chapter 15, to me, there is a great opportunity to describe what a great commission church looks like. And in chapter 15, verses 14 and following, as I read, the first thing is this. A great commission church will always be focused on the nations. Look at verse 14. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself... I'm convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to admonish one another. But I've written very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering to the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now, what's interesting here is, in verse 16, 
when he says to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, the word used for Gentiles there in the Greek is actually the word ethne, which is E-T-H-N-E. -E. That doesn't mean anything to you except this is why I, why I would tell you that. It's the same word that Jesus said, the same word Jesus used when he said, go and make disciples of all nations. So the word that Paul uses, which in the New American Standard, and New King James too, I think, is translated as Gentile, is actually the same, very same word that Jesus used when he said, I'm sending you to all nations. So in other words, what Paul is saying is, is he's, reminding of our, he's reminded of our calling to all nations. Not just here locally and there, but here, there, and everywhere, all together. But it, I thought it was pretty neat that it's the same, same Greek word that Jesus used when he said all nations. And so when he says Gentiles, he's talking about everyone. But look at the first thing he does. The first thing he does is he commends them of what God is doing in their life as we're focused on the nations. But in order to be focused on nations, there are some things in our life that, that Paul says he sees through the church. He says, I myself... Verse 14, also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to admonish one another. He talks about that goodness. He's, in other words, he says, look, I'm convinced. I see your life, and I see a life filled with righteousness. That's what the word goodness means. It means that there is goodness of heart. That means that they're being faithful to God. That means that the life that they're living before people is showing the goodness of God because the light of Christ is being shown through them. So he says, look, your lifestyle is showing that, that goodness that you have. He also says that you're filled with all knowledge. Now, look, there's no doubt that they're not theologians. They don't have seminary degrees. And the truth be known, I'm not sure how many Bible studies they've been in. But here's what I do know. He says you're filled with all knowledge in order to complete the task God has for you. So how's that the case, brother? I haven't been a Christian very long. If you've been a Christian one moment, you know I have a story of what Jesus has done in your life and the same thing that he desires to do in someone else's life. It's not about the lack of story. It's the lack of telling the story that is going on in your life. He says, I'm convinced you feel with all knowledge. It doesn't mean they didn't have, that they knew everything. What he's saying to him is you know enough to continue with the commission that God's put in your life. You know enough, and we do. But yet we use that excuse so many times that I don't know. I don't know what I would say. Here's what I do know. If you'll trust the Holy Spirit, he will give you the words to say, not some of the time, but all of the time. Amen. Every time. But there is, he says, you're full of goodness, filled with knowledge, able to admonish one another. In other words, he, he says because of that, you're able to admonish, to exhort one another, to encourage one another. In other words, he says, I see that in your life. God's using that. God is using that, and God is he's growing you, and for that reason, we've got to remember that. We need to be focused on the nations. Not only there's a commendation that he talks about in order to be focused, but there's a calling inside of that to be focused on the nations. Verse 16, Paul says, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Here's what Paul said. Our calling is this, to be a minister of the gospel of God to the Gentiles and to all nations. Let me tell you how important that word nations is to Paul. In chapter 15 of Romans, verses 9 through 27, if you just look at verses 9 through 27, we won't look at all those today, but if you just look at verses 9 through 27, Paul used that term 10 times. Do you think it's not important? We talk about when you study the Bible and a word is repeated, it's obviously repeated for a reason. There's some kind of uh, importance to it. Now, all the Bible is important, but I mean, is there the, they are stressing a certain point. That's just like if I'm teaching class in algebra, which none of y'all want to attend. I get it. I know that. I know you don't want to come to it. But if there's an important part, guess what? By the end of the day, my students have heard it multiple times. In fact, we say it so much, if it's that important, that by the end of the day, they're reciting it to me. Now, why is that important? Because I know they're learning it. They're retaining it. And so Paul continues to say 10 times in just a small part of the, passage of the Scripture in this passage where he says, all nations, to the nations. I'm going to tell you what. We get so upset, and here's, what, here's the most frustrating part. When we talk about going to all nations, we talk about going somewhere and sharing the gospel, we get negative feedback from the church, from God's people. We get it all the time. 
But if we ask you to bring a dish for a meal, nobody ever complains. Ouch. If I say we're going to have an ice cream fellowship, I'll get amens out the wazoo. Amen? Amen. I like ice cream. I like to eat. I like bringing a dish. But we start talking about stretching your vision and sacrificing something to go and reach your people who've never heard about Jesus. All of a sudden, that excitement becomes negative. You tell me our heart's not in the right place when we get more negative about sharing the gospel than we do filling our guts with food that someone else will bring? It's an indictment on the church today. That's where we are sometimes. In the, in the, I'm talking about in the world. I'm not just talking about us. I'm talking about the church as a general. You know why the church, you know why the numbers are fading? I'll tell you why. Because the lack of people going out and sharing the gospel with Christ. It's not that people aren't hungry. It's not that we're not living with lost people. In fact, the latest statistic says in the state of Tennessee, there's 3.76 million people lost without Jesus. That's what TBC just came out with. We heard it Thursday night in the, in the Alpha meeting right here in this building, right here in the sanctuary. 3.76 million people don't know Jesus just in the state of Tennessee. When we start talking about sacrifice, we start talking about going, we start talking about doing, all of a sudden it becomes negative. I don't get it. Guess what? Jesus was a missionary. And I'm thankful that he came. <laughs> he was. He came to reach a people who needed to hear the news about him. In fact, he came in such a way that it cost him his life. It wasn't just the father saying, hey, go and just say, tell them about you, tell them about me. In fact, he went, but he had to die in order to do it. That's what Jesus did. That's how important it was to reach out to the nations, to reach out to a world. But yet, the calling, Paul says, look, I have a calling. He says, I have a calling, and it's this. He says, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. But he says this in verse 15, I've written very boldly to you on some points to remind you again. It's not just Paul's calling. It's our calling to be a minister to the nations, to be a minister to the of the gospel. See, in order to be a Great Commission church, we have to be focused on the nations. We gotta expand our vision of where we're going, where we're reaching. And I've said this multiple times, but when he said you'd be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the most part, parts of the earth, in Acts chapter one, he meant all at the same time. All at the same time it ought to be going on. Not to complete one and the next one, to check it off, because the fact is, There'll never be a time that we're through witnessing where we are. Amen. But there is a time to expand our vision and witness where no one else is. I'll tell you the same thing I told you when I came back from Peru. It broke my heart when someone said to me, I'm thankful for America. Because I'll be honest with you, I look at where our nation is sometimes, it's hard to be thankful for a lot of stuff that's going on. I'm thankful to live here, don't get me wrong. But I look at what's going on and I get sick in my stomach. And I said, why are you thankful for America? He said, because it wasn't for America, Peru wouldn't know about Jesus. I said, how so? He said, because an American missionary came and sat down and told me about Jesus long ago. And now my goal is to tell everybody about him. <laughs> Broke my heart. I thought, he's exactly right. That's what it means to have a calling to go. To fulfill the Great Commission, the Great Commission Church. It will be focused on the nation. The second thing. The Great Commission Church will be centered on Christ. Verse 16 again, but we'll also go through 18. Some things in verses 16 through 18. He says to be a minister of Christ Jesus. There's, a, there's the description of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. <laughs> Ministering as a priest, the gospel of God. There it is again, the gospel. So that my offering to the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, therefore in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, and the power of signs and wonders and the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as the ly lyrical, I will have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I don't know if you caught it, but all you see about Paul, what he writes there, is Christ. Christ, Christ, and Christ. The gospel of God. The gospel of Christ. I preached Christ. What Christ is doing. Look, everything we do as a church ought to be centered on Christ. Amen. We'll never be a great commissioned people unless Christ is at the center of everything we do. 
every event, every time we meet, every ministry that we pursue, everything that we do ought to be centered around Christ. If it's not, then we're just meeting to meet, or we're just fellowshipping to fellowship. That's all we're doing. But yet, we'll never be a Great Commission church unless Christ is at the center. Do you think about what Paul said? He says in verse 17, Therefore in Christ Jesus I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. He said, women, I found something to boast about. But what was it? It wasn't in Paul. It wasn't in his life. It was in Christ Jesus. He said, I'm boasting in what Christ has done. That's exactly what Paul is saying. He says not only what he has done, but he says in verse 18, I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. You know what Paul could talk about? He could talk about his saving experience, salvation experience with Jesus. How Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and called him. And Paul surrendered his life to Christ. He could talk about how what God has been doing in his life. He could talk about all the things that Christ is doing. And look, when we have things to boast about, and he says, look, I, what I'm going to boast about is what Jesus is doing. What does it mean to talk to someone about Christ? Look, we're boasting in what Christ has done. When I share my testimony, I never brag about anything I've done because I know I've never done anything worth bragging about. But I do know Jesus who has and who is one to be boasted about. Amen. That's what Paul said. Think about Paul's testimony. Now, at one time, I was hunting down Christians. In fact, I was there when he stoned Stephen. That's what Paul could say. But yet Paul said, I am the chiefest of sinners. Why would he say that? Because he said, look, no one's more unworthy, if that's even correct, than me. But Jesus saw fit to save me anyway. He's talking about redeeming him. Talking about delivering him. He's talking about setting him free from that bondage of sin. Look, every child of God has a reason to boast in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every child of God. Not a few. Every. Unless you don't have a story about how God's changed your life. Then you're not a child of God. Because with that relationship with Christ comes a story of who I used to be and who I now am through and only through the blood and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. That's what it's all about. And Paul says, look, he says, I found a reason to boast. Found a reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. Verse 18, I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. You know, we worry about what are we going to say? What shall we do? Look, it's not about trying to figure out the words to say. It's about serving God and allowing him to speak through us. Henry Martin was a missionary to India and Persia. died at the age of 31. Don't you hear what he said? He said, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. The nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we will become. What you think about that? He said, the nearer we get to him, the Spirit of Christ, God's Holy Spirit, Christ himself, the nearer we get to him, in other words, the closer we get to Jesus, the more intensely missionary we will become. I guarantee you, we won't be, we won't have a mind to share Christ unless we're walking, first of all, in Christ. And the more you learn and the more you're in love with Christ, the more you want to tell someone else about all that he's done, that he's doing in your life. I guarantee your walk with God will determine how mission-minded I am and you are. And if you walk with God is nothing but a game, you're not going to share Christ with anybody. First of all, if you walk with God is nothing but a game, you may need Christ yourself. But if it's actually changing your life, if he's changing your life and stirring your heart every single day, you can't wait to tell someone else about it. Every day I wake up, I've told you this for the last several weeks, I know. Every day I wake up and say, Lord, let me be intentional about sharing Jesus with somebody. Amen. You say, everybody knows. I shared Christ with a girl this week and I asked her. I said, do you even know what it means? What you've been talking. Do you even know what it means to be saved? She said, no, not really. Grew up in church. That's not indicting on anybody, church or anything else. Grew up in church. Knew about the story. When I share with her the story of Christ and how God sent him to die on the cross and how he rose from the grave and how he, he's offered himself for us and shared the gospel. Romans rose and all those things through that. 
And I finally asked, do you know what it means to be saved? And she said, I really, I really don't. <laughs> so would you like to know? And she said, yes, I would. And so I read a few more passages. She didn't accept Christ yet, but I'm praying every day that she does real soon. Amen. And guess what? I want to share with her again this week. And if she didn't accept Christ, I'm going to share with her again next week. Not to be harassing, but to love her enough to say, let me tell you about Jesus. Say, Brother Ryan, why? I tell you why. Because I can't, I, I can't get over what Jesus has done in my life, and I've got to tell somebody else about it. That's why. That's why. He's not special about me. He died for her just like he did me. He died for them just like he did you. But yet Paul says, I found reason to boast, but it's all in Christ. How can he boast in Christ? Because he could talk about God setting him free from the sins of his, in his life. He set him free from the baggage. Think about what Paul carried around as he was the persecutor of the church. But yet God set him free and used him. And so Paul said, look, I want to center everything that I do around Christ. Look, when Christ is at the center of your life, you will be radically changed third thing is this. Not only will the Great Commission Church be focused on the nations, it be centered on Christ, but to have a passion for the lost. Look at verses 20 and following. And thus I aspire to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so I would not build on another man's foundation, but as it is, but as it is written, excuse me, they who have no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. For this reason, I have often been prevented from coming to you, but now with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you. He says, Wherever I, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and be helped on my way there by you. But a few verses here. We'll have a passion for the lost. That's exactly what Paul says. He says, I aspire to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build another man's foundation, but where they had not heard. If we go back a few verses, and I actually didn't talk about it just a moment ago, but he says in 19, he says, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. He doesn't mean that everybody there has heard. There are obviously people there who have not heard. But when he says, I have fully preached, he has done what God had called him to do. He preached. People got saved. And guess what? It was their responsibility now to preach the gospel, to take it further, to disciple and to reach others. And that's what good missions do. They go and not only do they share Christ, but they disciple. Because when you leave there, you want them to be able to take that word and take that discipleship and take that and share with others. And so they grow. And when they disciple another group, it grows. And that's what it was about. And Paul said, look, he said, I have fully preached here where I am, but I've had a desire to go where no one has been. In other words, where people have not heard. Paul said, that's my desire. My desire is for the lost people who have not heard. Think about it. I was reading the other day, and I could be, and the number it may have changed. It's it's a little, it's a couple years old. But they were talking about over 27 people groups, languages that have yet to have a Bible translated in their language. But you think about that, 2700, not 27, who have yet to have the Bible translated in their own language. <clears throat> Folks, if we don't tell them about Jesus, who's going to? Who's going to? Who is? Paul said, I want to go where no man has went. I want to go where they have not heard. And that was his challenge to them. It was to have a, a passion for lost people. Maybe those down the end of your road hadn't heard. Maybe those around the block hadn't heard. Maybe there's some in your own home that have not heard. And share with them. But instead of being negative about someone wanting to go share Christ, how about we do what God's called us to do and be faithful to the calling of God to share wherever and whenever we go. That's what we ought to be about doing. Because every time we talk about it, someone say, hey, mission start at home. I say, that's exactly right. What have you done? What are you doing right now? What are you doing? Who are you sharing with? Where's your ministry? What are you doing? How can I help you? What are you doing? What ministry? Where's your, where, what's God laying on your heart? What people have God been laying on your heart? Are they down the road from you? Are they down the hall from you? The neighbor county from you? Why has God laid them on your heart? Because look, here's the thing. If God's laid down on your heart, then tell us about it. Let's rally and go together. That's usually not the response we get. We always expect everybody else to do it. Well, I'll tell you like I've told you for 
no, going on 19 years. I'm thankful. When no one else would come to my house and tell me about Jesus, one man said, I'll go. When a couple of men looked at him and said, you better never know what he's liable to say. Good luck. I'm glad he had the guts and the courage and the calling on his life to be faithful and said, I'll go. And you know who came with him? Nobody. <laughs> one man. God completely changed my life through Jesus Christ, first of all. But it started with one man who had the courage to come to me and say, Ronnie, you need Jesus in your life. Well, I'm glad he didn't wait on somebody else to do it. How many people out there that you have relationships with, you have connections with, that don't know Jesus right now? Paul said, I'm going to go to a place where they don't know Christ. They had not hurt me. God's people, a great commission church, will always have a passion for the lost. Here's the saddest part. I found this quote. This is not original me. The guy said, we talk about the second coming of Christ. The only bad news is we talk about the second coming when half the world hadn't heard of the first yet. Oh, it's God's people. We're excited about the return of Christ. Amen? Amen. If you're not excited about it, you better check your heart. I'm excited about it. But you know what? That's true. We talk more about Jesus returning for us than we do telling those about the first time that he came for them. Read that statement and stab me right through the heart. We talk about the second coming, but yet half the world hasn't heard about the first one yet. Last thing I want to share with you. The Great Commission Church will be focused on the nations. will be centered in Christ. We'll have a passion for the lost. And we'll help those that God sins. Verse 24. Paul says, Whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you, when I first enjoyed your company for a while. Paul says, Look, when I go and as I travel, I hope to see you and to be helped on my way there by you. You know what he knew? He knew this church, this group of people, would help him as he went. Look, there's a calling for us to help those who go. A calling for us to give to those who go. That's why we talk about Annie Armstrong. That's why we talk about Lottie Moon. That's why we talk about Operation Christmas Child. That's why we talk about all these other ministry opportunities. And the truth is, God desires for us to support those things. Doesn't mean that you and have to support all of them, but here's the truth. Everything we have, we're stewards of because God has given us anyway. You do realize you don't own anything. My name may be on the title, but the truth is, God owns it. And I know whether the word says it or not, but under my name really means steward of. God's allowed me to be steward over for just a small portion of time. And one day it will all be gone. I know it. I'm fully aware of it. Regardless of what that title says. I know what God says in his word. I'm going to allow you to be stewards over it. But you know what? Well, joyfully give. Pray and give to those who are called, those who go, those ministries that are being done, those mission opportunities that are being fulfilled. We ought to be helped by them. It's not just about giving, by the way. Look, it's more than that. It's more than giving finances. It's about giving of your time. It's about praying. It's about supporting, encouraging. It's all of that. But I'll tell you what we've done in the Southern Baptist Convention. We thought that if we write a check for a mission, that we've been missioned. We have done missions work. No, you have not. You have supported the mission work, but you're not involved in it until you decide to get up out of the seat and go share Christ with someone. That's what makes a difference. I tell you this. We have people go, and we got people go, and I give. That's not a boastful thing. I'm just saying. We've had ministries, but I'll tell you what changed my life when I got out of the seat and went. That's what changed my life. And I know all the reasons why you can't go, and you can tell them to God. I get it. But I can tell you all the reasons why you can. And it's one. Because Jesus said, go and tell the nations. Amen. That's why. A great commission church will be focused on the nations. Will be centered on Christ. Will have a passion for the lost. And will help those that God sends out. I don't know about you, but I want God to look down at First Baptist Lovell and say, there's a great commission church. Amen. That's who they are. Because if he doesn't see that, then we're being disobedient to the entire word 
他不要。Where's your heart today? Are you willing to give up something to do something for the gospel? Are you willing to sacrifice whatever it may be to go, to give, to be a part of? It? Here's what I know. No matter what you give up, what I give up, what we think we're giving up, it's nothing compared to what Jesus gave when he gave his life for us. I'm going to leave you with a quote I said a minute ago. The closer we come to Christ, the more intensely, intensely we'll be about missions. The more in love we are with Jesus, the more we will tell others about his love for us. That I do know. Would you bow your heads with me?